Welcome back to the Couch Potato Show. Me and the boys are back again for episode 48. Uh, Eric, how are you doing? Back with us again after a missed week. Feeling good. Feeling good. Good. You're not dead. We're happy. Frank, oh, how are you doing? I'm phenomenal. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a little windy. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. A little windy? Well, it knocked me over earlier. Um, <laughs> That's because your belly got a tooth thing. How dare you? Oh, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> Um, yeah, so a lot to talk about this week, uh, pretty much just going to focus on the draft this week, just because of how crazy it was on Thursday night. Um, and even yesterday with the second and third rounds, um, I have no idea what's going on today with four five, six and seven, but no one really cares. So, uh, we'll get into picks real quick because we do have a NASCAR race this weekend and we do not have a significant uh, UFC fight, as Eric said. Yeah, yeah as deemed by our committee, not significant enough. So, <laughs> our committee is just yeah. Eric. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, picks from last week. Uh, we did pick the uh, Usman versus Masvidal fight. Everyone got a point for Usman. Um, and we picked the Geico 500 at Talladega, which was a wild one that Ryan Blaney almost won. And uh, came very close to who was my pick. Denny Hamlin struggled all day. That was Frank's pick. Uh, I think he was like two last down or something. Uh, but Eric came away with the uh, the best finish out of all of us. Kevin Harvick, I think, finished third or fourth or something. Thanks, oh Kev. I know you're a big fan. Thank you. Yeah. So Appreciate Eric, it. Eric went with old reliable and uh, took away a point. So uh, Frank, I believe you have the updated points because I do not. I do. Hold on. Give me two seconds. Oh, and we also have the NFL draft, uh, our mock draft points. I want a full apology from you guys. You guys said I would suck. And I want it. So. I don't think I said that. I don't think Tyler I said definitely that. did. I don't know. Eric probably didn't. He doesn't care enough. I don't enough. think I said that. You, you, I'm... <laughs> Caption on the mock draft. How I long did Frank get this one? Don't remember saying that. It's on. It's right. I'm reading it. It's right here. Frank, that was an intern for our show. That wasn't Tyler. <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? You think that was me? Yeah, that was Dale. That's a good guy. I like Dale. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Updated score. Me and Eric have 70 and Tyler is 69. Yeah. Nice. Um, the, uh, the mock you draft scores. Nice I wasn't going to. The mock draft scores. Frank got nine out of 32 picks. Uh, I got seven out of 32, and Eric brought up the rear with six out of 32. So I will say Mel Kuyper only got six, so I'm better than Mel Kuyper. That's true. So am I. I am equal to Mel Kuyper. That's not something you want to be, Eric. That's sad. What are you That's not what you want to be. Not great. Um, <laughs> picks for this week. We do have a NASCAR race, as we said. We're going to Kansas. For the all-time greatest name for a NASCAR race in the history of NASCAR. Uh, this week we have the Bushy McBush 400 at Kansas. Tyler told uh, me that yesterday. Actually, I thought he was joking. They actually held a fan vote uh, to uh, to name the to name the race. Bush Bush Beer had a fan vote, and this was one of the four finalists. And it won the and it won the the vote out of those. Do four. we know what the other four finalists were? Were they better or worse? Um, by the end of this episode, I will find it. Okay. Not. And uh, we ourselves will vote on it, and let's see if we got it right. Yeah. See if we agree with them. That's a um, good second. All right. So uh, I guess I start off because I'm in last. Yep. That sucks. All right. Uh, this week at Kansas, I'm gonna take Alex Bowman. Uh, had a pretty good uh, race at Talladega last week. Again, Talladega is not really a stra- uh, show of who's uh, been doing pretty well this season or anything because it is Talladega. Um, but did have a very good race at Richmond. He won the Richmond race. Um, and Kansas is one of those races where I don't really want to throw in any of my really, like, my star drivers because I feel like they have stronger tracks that I don't want to use their pick at Kansas where it's kind of just a coin flip. Cause I'll, there's a lot of guys that just aren't great at Kansas. And there's a lot of guys that have never really done very well at Kansas. So yeah, no one really stood out, 
So I'm going to take the hot hand. I'm going to take Alex Bowman. Frank, who you got? Uh, I'm trust. I'm honestly, I'm tr- still trying to decide. Oh wow. I'm gonna just I'm gonna just roll with who I have. I was gonna change it, and then I'm I'm just like screw. It. I'll just take I'll take Denny Hamlin again. Uh, he's won two out of the past three years there. I like Denny, big old FedEx truck. I was considering uh, Truex again, but I think Denny's a little bit better at Kansas. But like Tyler said, Kansas is kind of a mess. So and you know. yeah, there's no. Well, how many how many speedways do we have left? A lot. Uh, well, I probably shouldn't have taken Denny then. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Rip. Rip to you. Well, now I just regret my pick. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's gonna be a slot fest at the end for me. I'm gonna be taking my Cole Custer. All right, Eric, who you got? I think you picked him last week, Tyler Mains. I'm gonna go with Ryan Blaney. So it's where it's where we're feeling. I was debating, debating between him and a couple other guys, but I'm not gonna say them out loud because if I say them out loud, I'm gonna seem stupid if they finish ahead. So it's going to be Ryan Blaney. So well, who, who are they? You're, you're going to – it's fine. You're not going to seem stupid. Yeah, yeah. None of us are really knowledgeable enough to – It's a good point. No, no. It, to be honest, <laughs> it was Kislaski. That was the other fella. I was considering Kislaski. There you go. I don't think I picked Kislaski yet. I don't think. I don't – yeah. I uh, I don't think anybody has for uh, the Speedways. Yeah, no one has. So, yeah, I don't think so either. So um, Bowman for me, Hamlin for Frank. And uh, Blaney, Blaney for Eric with Dillard Croy. Yeah, I can't wait for like Three two months down him. the road. Woo. Two months down the road, my super my speedway picks are going to be such a mess. I'm going to be picking like a random dude. Dude, I've been saving mine pretty well. You have, I've been saving them in, in other types of tracks, not the speedways though. Like my speedway picks so far Tyler Reddick, Joey Logano, and Kevin Harvick. So Last year I would have said Kevin Hart's a big one, but he hasn't done anything this year. So. Yeah, he has. He's been uh, outside of last week at Talladega. He's been pretty, pretty been really garbage. Yeah. So, um, yeah, those are our picks for the Bushy McBush 400. Um, all right, let's talk NFL draft. So, the first few picks weren't really of any surprise. We kind of figured out. Uh, uh, about two or three years ago that Trevor Lawrence was going to be the number one overall pick. Um, Zach Wilson came into, came into the scene for the Jets at number two, maybe two or three months ago. Uh, so there was really no debate there. And then um, the only real debate in the top three was Trey Lance or Mac Jones, the 49ers. And it came, came out on Thursday morning that, Trey Lance was the odds on favorite uh, to be picked. And he was Falcons didn't really do anything out of the ordinary when it going best player available with uh, Kyle Pitts. And then I believe the, the Bengals were at five, correct? Yep. Bengals kind of, kind of did uh, their Bengals thing. And, I, uh, I think it was wrong. I think it was dumb. Like, like, like I had it, I had it in my mock draft just because I thought that's the way they would go. But um, doesn't mean I agree with the pick. They should have won Sewell. I think it'd be better. Yeah. So for those living under a rock, um, the Bengals went with Jamar Chase, former uh, teammate of Joe Burrow, uh, instead of Penny Sewell, who is an offensive tackle um, that would have helped protect Joe Burrow after Joe Burrow almost died last year. So multiple occasions. Yeah. Interesting pick there. I don't know. I feel. I feel like I understand. Like they want an offensive weapon, but like it doesn't really matter what weapons you have for Joe Burrow if he can't be on the field. Yeah. Here's the question, though: How much of that pick was due to Burrow loving that pick? Like how? Oh, I think it was 100 percent for us playing with Jamar Chase. And can we can we blame that as I usually blame stuff on? Can we blame that on the LeBron Jameses of the sports world to where they're a great player, they're a superstar, they're a marketable guy? And then boom, all right, I'm the GM now. I, I'm calling the shots. If you want to keep me happy, if you want to hope to get me on another long-term contract when the time comes, you're going to draft who I want to draft. I don't know. I, you could also, we're, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but with the Jaguars' uh, second first-round pick, I think you'd see that too. Trevor Lawrence's guy in the backfield. So, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't think you could equate that to this because Joe Burrow has only played what two years in the league, and one of them he got torn ACL for. So I don't really think he has that. No, kind of Joe power. Burrow I think is only to... Joe Burrow was a rookie last year. Yes. So oh yeah, so one year in the league, league and he only played half his ACL. But I think I think Cincinnati is an extremely desperate franchise. That's what I think, and That's I think true. they're Joe Burrow is supposedly a great talent. You know, obviously we saw what he did in was. college. We even saw what he did last year in the NFL when he was healthy. So I think it's such an area of desperation. It's, you could almost compare it to an unhealthy relationship, right? It's, it's toxic. Yeah. It's a toxic relationship. Joe Burrow's clearly, clearly the better looking person in this relationship. <laughs> Angles are trying to He's incredibly handsome. Himself. I'm going to be honest. He's a good looking guy. He is a good looking guy. So this really, this metaphor works all around in a <laughs> sense as well, but yes. I don't know. I, I just, I just think protection for him would have been better in my opinion. No. Me Did too. you guys see the picture that they released with the with Joe Burrow's like it was a picture of Joe Burrow sitting on like a throne, uh, and he had that yeah, giant, yeah like, it looked like an eighty inch scar on his knee. Yeah, he, he, had, he had reconstructive ACL surgery. That was and like when you take a picture like that and kind of emphasize something like that, you kind of think you're going to go offensive tackle to maybe prevent that from happening on the other knee. You'd think so, but no. And one of the pictures I saw that was funny. They had some random player, I don't know who it was, sitting down, and Joe Burrow was the one standing up in half of them. And I'm like, can we get Joe Burrow to just sit down? The guy's yeah. got a new ACL. Can you just give him, give him a little rest? They're not doing a very good job of protecting him. Let's just say that. Yeah, it's almost like it's out of order. You know, it's like, all right, first, you need the guy to grab the ball, right? The quarterback. You need him to, you know, step back in the pocket. And then you need to give him time. And after that, you need the then you weapon. can get offensive weapons for him. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's almost like for me, it's it's out of order. It's out of order. The it's offense, like, kind of like the Giants, but not as bad. Like the Giants' yeah. line isn't good, but it's not as bad as the Bengals. Yeah, we'll get there eventually. But we'll I just I don't get the sequence of events, and I really do think it's chalked up to not only Joe Burrow being in a more powerful position that he can be, but I think you could chalk it up to the, for lack of a better word, entitled. Uh, controlling nature of some young athletes today. I think they're, they're like, I deserve the world. Not only do I deserve these endorsement deals, these massive contracts, which I can't blame them for, right? If you offered me a deal like no, that. No, if you gave it to me, I would take it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it's a, uh, I get it. I get what's going on. It's a meritocracy. You, you do well, you get paid, you generate money. Word. What'd you say? It's a great word. Thank you, Frank. But yes, yes. <laughs> There you go. Mains, take it over. What else? Um, what do you think, Mains? We didn't hear your opinion yet. No, I think it was a dumb move. I get that they were teammates at LSU, and I understand that they have that connection. Um, and they were the first to go along those lines of uh, the the uh, college reunions, I guess you can call it, in the draft that we, that we saw this year. But um, take Pene Sewell there. It's so easy. He's the best debatably often debatably the best offensive tackle in the draft. Uh, Rashawn Slater was also looking pretty good coming in from Northwestern. But if you're going to go, if you're going to go with anything, I think the pick should have been offensive tackle, especially after how badly Joe Burrow got beat up last year. Um, and you know what, even yesterday, they didn't really emphasize the offensive line you've even uh, that much in the second and third rounds. So I, I don't understand what they're doing. Whatever they know they're doing either. Probably not going to work. They're going to try it though. Listen, Jamar Chase is a great player, but like, I don't know. I think it would have been, I think there's a better pick there. Um, they did get um, Jackson Carmen offensive tackle out of Clemson with their second round pick. Um, Trevor Lawrence's lead offensive tackle. So. I, uh, when Penny Sewell is on the board and you don't take him, everyone else just kind of seems. And then yeah. their third round pick was uh, defensive end. And then, and then since then today, they've gone defensive end, defensive tackle, defensive tackle, Kicker. It's bizarre. Because kicker is an area of need for the Bengals. Who cares about the freaking kicker? You can get a kicker anytime. The kicker is the smallest need the Bengals have. Anyway, enough about the freaking Bengals because we could talk about the Bengals for ages, how bad they are. 
Um, it's true. On a more positive note, uh, the Chicago Bears actually had a good draft for once. Now, it did take some help because Dave Gettleman's uh, stupidity in trading back. I'm sorry, actually, I'll rephrase that. Um, Dave Gettleman's trading back um, to for the Giants getting the 20th pick instead of picking at 11, moving the Bears up to 11. Uh, put the Bears into position to get Justin Fields or Mac Jones if they wanted a quarterback, and they did. They got Justin Fields. Some are saying probably the second, maybe the second best prospect, quarterback prospect in the draft behind Trevor Lawrence. Probably. That's where I put him. I like him better than Mac Jones. No offense to you, Ty. No, I, I don't take offense to that. I mean, I might put. I, honestly, I might put that Justin Fields second. I mean, yeah, I don't really see anything in Zach Wilson or Trey Lance, but I think I Trey Lance is a better shot than Zach. It's a, huge, it's a huge pick for the Bears just because they haven't had a good draft in my entire like, life. God knows, God knows <laughs> how long. So too long. Good move. For the Bears. I like it for them. It's a good pick. They got who they wanted. They definitely, they desperately needed a quarterback. So, it's the way to go. They gave up a lot in the trade, though. They did. That's why I'm not as low on the Giants trading back as you are. No, I'm not low on the Giants trading back. I think the the Giants trading back was good because um, they wanted Devonte Smith, and if it wasn't going to be Devonte Smith, um, then they wanted probably Penny Sewell. If Rashawn Slater was going to be the first part, first offensive tackle drafted. Obviously, Sewell went a lot earlier to the Lions. So those picks were off the table for the Giants. They trade back. They get a first-round pick next year. They could have gotten Slater, though, if they wanted. They could have, but honestly, I think think the trade back was more valuable for them. Definitely was. Because you don't know how good the the Bears are going to be next year. So Where where I think they went wrong was what they did with the pick, Um, going out and getting Kadarius Toney. Um, I'm not, you're, you're lower on it than I am, but obviously you're more knowledgeable. So maybe I should just go with your opinion. I'm not, I'm not as low on that pick. I'm okay with it. Like, I don't like it. I think there are better options, but. I'm as knowledgeable as like nobody. I I don't know. I I think he's an, he's not athletic. He's fun to watch. I I don't know. He he can, he's fast. He can create separation. That's what we, that's what they needed. If they didn't get Devontae Smith, it's not as good as Devontae Smith, obviously, but. I don't know. And, and then I, I like Ozio Jalari in the second round. That was a good pick. They picked him up, up yesterday, I think. That redeemed them a lot, I think. Yeah, he was a first round talent. I had him in my mock draft the first round, and they got him like 50th or something like that. Yeah, I had him going 21 to the Colts originally. Um, so the fact that the Giants got him that late was pretty impressive. That's, yeah, that's why I'm not disappointed in their draft, if we're going to be honest. Yeah. So and fun. honestly, you can flip flop the picks. If it that's what sense. I said. I said I thought it was like if you asked me like three days ago which one was more likely, I would have said Ozzy first. Yeah, and Tony in the second round. But hey, whatever works. Um, but they do get Kadarius Tony, um, who was the fourth wide receiver taken off the board after the drop from the top three. Um. Because Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, and Jamar Chase are just miles uh, miles ahead no, it's of not anybody true. else. Um, so we talked about the Bengals reuniting Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. We talked about – or we covered a little bit um, Devontae Smith reuniting with his former college teammate Jalen Hurts in Philly. Um, that was super weird. The Eagles Dolphins and Cowboys reunited, trading. That was super weird. The Dolphins reunited Jalen Waddle with his college quarterback in Tua Tagovailoa. And then Eric, we get to your team. We do. Yeah. Uh, the Jaguars decided to reunite Travis Etienne with his college quarterback, Trevor Lawrence. Now I want you to take off your um, NFL scripted hat. Um, it's a big hat. Think big like hat. any fan would that isn't knowledgeable enough to think that the NFL is scripted, obviously, because yes. 
your mind on that subject is far beyond anybody else's. So what do you think? What do you think of ETN going at 25? Here's the thing. First, I'm just going to touch a little bit more on the general philosophy of why we're seeing so many of these, you know, former college players. And what do you guys, I'll, uh, I'll answer your question with a, with a little short question. But is this good for growth? Is it good to have some sort of familiarity, familiarity around? Or Frank, what I'm getting at is what I think Frank is getting at already based on that head shake. Don't you want to, I don't, I'm not saying, you know, these are 21 year olds or however old they are, you know, you push them, they're already, you know, they're not, they're not young, impressionable, naive children, right? It's for lack of a better phrase, just sort of push them in there. Don't give them that comfort blanket of, oh, I had a bad day of practice. Well, I'm going to talk to my friend over here. No, 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 no. Like, it's good that you reflect on the bad moments during practice and you reflect on bad games. But that's, that's, I don't know, that's all very general um, philosophical. A, a separate point for me is, like, I think trying to take what happens in college and trying to translate it directly to the NFL with the same, like, two players, let's say, I think it's very unlikely that it works in college and both in the NFL. That's just my opinion. Yeah, okay, that's fair, too. And now, I, as for uh, as for Trevor Lawrence and his guy, um, I don't know. I think the Jaguars have so many clear holes to fill. True. And I think James Robinson last year, undrafted or not undrafted, was fantastic for what, given the offensive line he was given, given the offensive coordinator he was given, he made chicken salad out of chicken you know what. He was he was great, <laughs> in my opinion. Honest to God. When it was very good. I yeah, he was phenomenal. So I but I get the mindset, you know, you need two running backs in the NFL, the depth. I think it was stupid. There were better picks taken after him. Me too. I agree with that. And I, I, but once again, I could admire depth, right? We were just talking about Joe Burrow here, how he got shellacked multiple times last year. Has the big old I, I, feel, I feel like, I feel like depth is good, but first of all, to have depth, you have to have good primary players. I don't yes. have good primary players. You is, is exactly where I was going, Frank. You need okay, the, sorry. You, no, no worries. You, you, you said it beautifully. You need the first string in order to have the second string, right? And the Jack don't have a lot of first string players. That's the reality. The defensive side of the ball is just chaos. Their second three is horrendous. This defense is unrecognizable from the days of the Jackson five in the secondary. Who's who's the over only overlap? Maybe Miles Jack. I don't even know. He might have bailed on us too. It's a disaster. Yeah, it's an still, absolute disaster. I believe so as well. So I don't know. I, I would have taken Elijah Moore out of Ole Miss. Like, yeah. he, he's a wide receiver, but even that would have been a better pick for you guys. You don't have any wide receivers either. And he was taking, yeah, what, like I, two picks after that? I, don't know, I, I wouldn't no. have liked that either. I wouldn't have liked that either. I, I mean, I wouldn't have liked it either, but I, I would have liked it better than ETN. Yeah, you can convince me of that. But I think – I just – I don't know. You got to you gotta get off an offensive line for Lawrence, too. There's just so many holes to fill and so little picks in the draft. And I, we weren't active enough in free agency. But I don't know. If, if Trevor Lawrence is all that in a bag of chips, as has been advertised – It'll be, it's going to be a great year, right? Like, I don't know. Now, we'll I'll say, say this. I'll say this back on your first question. Um, I kind of think it is good to have some college overlap into the NFL. <clears throat> I think it definitely helps. Like, um, take Jalen Waddle, for example. Jalen Waddle's coming into a whole, he's got, coming from college, going into the NFL. Um, going into a whole new style of offense, going through all this um, as a rookie wide receiver. Don't you think it would help him learn more and like develop more if he were to learn from somebody that he knows very well in Tua? I can see that argument. Yeah. I, I, know, I, just, I just think it's unlikely that it'll, it'll work as well or like close to where it was in college because like in college they, they're used to dominating together so i feel like it'd be a way different atmosphere yeah, but they know like. that's the thing they know how to dominate i mean obviously yeah dominate. but it's a completely different game no, no no i know i know i know i know honestly obviously dominating in college is totally different than dominating in the nfl like i was gonna say but um they know they know each other the, the chemistry there is good same with etn and trevor lawrence Trevor Lawrence coming into this has probably never spoken to James Robinson in his life. So, 
he has played pretty much every I think he has played every every single snap at Clemson with ETN in his backfield. So um if they're if they're in like a close let's say they're in a close game or something and they're going no huddle or something uh Trevor Lawrence throws a quick sign to ETN that has been with him for four years at this point. Um I think that 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 pairing might work better in that situation than Trevor Lawrence and James Robinson. Uh, honestly, yeah, I absolutely agree with that, especially clutch time where it's at that point, it's muscle memory, right? You're not, yeah. you're not really thinking about what you're doing. So I completely agree with that. And there's the locker room cultural side of it with the two Alabama guys. We'll just go there for the sake of convenience. They have obviously succeeding college, seeing the NFL. No one's claiming that's the same thing whatsoever. But I think the fact that you could have some confidence, have some swagger, have some winning culture, I think that goes a long way in any in any business, in any industry, in any area of life, I believe. So it's a mixed bag. And at the end of the day, it's an unanswerable question because some players, I'm sure, will use – sort of be competitive with one another and their familiarity will provide an outlet of comfort and they'll use it in a constructive way. But some players will, oh, sh- I screwed up. And their buddy will be like, F it. You're the man. Who cares? Don't think about it. I so think I'd rather a- have my young guys on, on their toes and not, like, familiar with – not like I – get, I get what Tyler's saying with the familiarity of their players, but I don't know. I feel like I would want, like, my player to be able to, to adjust to, like, every every new player that comes into the team, you know? Yeah. I, don't know. I see both sides of it. Um, As well. the, other, the other thing I wanted to say was on the second point that you made um, – I completely agree that Travis Etienne was not the pick here. I mean, obviously, the terrible pick. Um, you, the, you look at the Jaguars coming into Thursday, coming into the draft, uh, the worst team in the NFL by record. Maybe not right. roster-wise. Maybe the Jets could take that. But by record, the Jaguars were the worst team in the NFL. Um, no Jets. And after two days, uh, after one day, sorry, I won't even count – uh, the day two and day three. After one day in the draft, the Jaguars already have arguably the best backup quarterback in the NFL and arguably the best backup running back in the NFL. And they have no depth at any other position. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Probably. Unfortunately, so. Uh, Eric, can you name a wide receiver that they have right now? DJ Chark, uh, LaVisca Chenault. LaVisca Chenault was a bust. Yeah, he was a big old bust. DJ Chark was great a couple seasons ago. Last year, he underperformed. So, yeah, I got, you know, there's a handful of guys, but not not a good wide receiver core. They've never had a sure wide defense. That's what they need the most. Yeah. Yeah. No, that it's too. Terrible. That too. I can get on board with that. Yeah. I, I don't know why you would go ETN there when you can easily go defense, go offensive line to just – protect trevor lawrence your golden boy yeah. um i don't know why you would go to the position that you're already your your best position I don't if, know why you believe it or not i think i might be a little bit more positive because if i were to grade the etn pick i'd probably give him a c minus to be honest not good at all i like if i get a c minus i'm very upset bad 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 there's no way to you can't put makeup on a pig but i think there are some You know, it's the two running back formation I'm generally a fan of. I think could be a bit more elusive, a bit more creative. And, you know, as much as James Robinson was great last year, he's an undrafted rookie. So who really knows what he'll be in year two? But, yeah, listen, C minus. Obviously, it's not satisfactory whatsoever. That's how I personally feel. If you guys. I just think I just think running back's not a position of like like value. Like even in today's NFL, like we even see like a lot of running backs don't really have a lot of value. Yeah. Besides, like, the superstar running backs, like Elliott, who had a terrible, like, past two or three seasons. Saquon, who can't stay healthy at all. So, I don't know. How valuable is a running back? Don't really know. It's not a good point, but that's also how I feel about receivers, to be quite honest. Really? I, th- I think they're more valuable than running backs, personally. I I'm, I disagree. I think you have a th- – hey, but it's, it's Running backs are a premium in the NFL, and that's no secret. What did you say? Running backs are a premium to have in the NFL. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but you saw the Giants last year. They had Sa- they didn't have Saquon, and they were arguably better on offense. How valuable they are to your team's success is different. It is no secret that running backs are a premium in the NFL. You saw that with the Giants even before they before they had Saquon. 
I mean, their running back core was atrocious, and they couldn't get anything. And that's one of the reasons why they sucked, because they couldn't run the ball. They couldn't set up the pass. Yeah. So Hard to open up good routes for receivers when the defense knows what's coming, right? Very hard. On a third and one, you're forced to throw the ball constantly. You look at all these. You look at all these teams that have that that go on to win Super Bowls or win uh, AFC NFC championship games. They don't necessarily have that stud running back like a like a Zeke or a Saquon, um, but they have somebody that can disrupt a defense and make the defense consider them a possibility. They have a serviceable of, running back. It's serviceable. Yeah, it's not like terrible, but it's not great. So, I don't know. I, I don't I'm excited know. to see what the Giants' offense looks like this year with, with Saquon back and all the new weapons they have. There's no excuse for uh, for Danny Dimes now. Absolutely not. You got Kenny Dalligate, Tony. Saquon's back. You have every weapon. Put up or shut up, Danny Dimes. It's, it's, um, it's the year. All right, I'm gonna. Do, we're gonna start a little uh, little segment here. It's not really gonna be a segment segment, but. We're gonna do a little thing here because of because uh, of the draft being this past week. I'm gonna run through uh, three or four uh, draft picks, um, and I'm don't I don't want you guys to tell me if they're going to be a good player or a bust. I want you to tell me whether or not the pick itself was good, or if it was a bust pick. Um, like I think we all agree on the Travis Etienne pick was a bust. Um, whether or not he's going to be good in the NFL or not, bad pick. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's start with uh, start with the Falcons. They Ooh. went with Kyle Kyle Pitts at number four. Eric, this is the perfect example. Tyler Maines. It's a great example. I don't think anyone is denying his talent and ability. No. Right? He's no. fantastic. Yes. But this is this is the great thing. I always, you know, I don't like being an armchair quarterback. I don't like saying, oh. Why they do that? Because these people, they run a sports organization. They're far more knowledgeable about this than I'll ever be. But I have an actual feeling, you know, they went to those war room camera shots, you know, and during the draft, Mm -hmm. I have an actual feeling like if I just trotted in there and was like, hey, guys, like, oh, yeah, how about some defense? They'd be like, what is that? What does (laughs) that mean? They, They don't like defense at all. This is, you got Matt Ryan. He's been great just draining his career of any sort of relevance. You have a generational talent, Julio Jones, as a wide receiver. You had Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman back in the day as a great duo. But the issue has always been the defense, and they've just blown leads from the 28-3 situation to the previous season, blowing it to a subpar Cowboys team. This team has no defense, and they have no willingness to adopt a defense whatsoever. It is it is truly amazing to me how – they're just – they're like, offense, offense, this is the sexy pick. We want this. Kyle Pitts, so much potential. But you, what, is he going to rush the quarterback too? It's just none of this works. You need a nice, well-rounded franchise. Frank, take it away. What do you think? Um, I, I agree with Eric. I, I agree that they never have any defense. They never, they've never had a good defense from what I remember. But my draft philosophy in all drafts, no matter what sport it is, is that you take the most talented player left on the board. And for me, Kyle Pitts was mo- the most talented player left. You could have went Penny Sewell is pretty talented. Jamar Chase is talented. They don't need a wide receiver, obviously. They got Julio Jones. And so I think it was I think it was their best pick. Now, Eric brought this up to me when we were watching the draft on Thursday. Like those those skill positions, they don't really usually go that high. I think I was talking to somebody else about this. I don't know who, who else it was. Um, but when you have a guy like Kyle Pitts, and that guy is like a gen not, not a generational talent, but he's he's like no, I think he Stup- is. Stupidly talented. Stupidly I'd say talented. He is. You think he is. So I think in drafts, you can't go wrong if you take the most talented player left on the board. And at four, Kyle Pitts is the most talented player left. So here's here's my thing. I I don't like the pick because you do have it's kind of a mixture of what you both of you guys said. You do have Julio Jones. Uh you do have Calvin Ridley. Two of the best receivers in the NFL. And you can't succeed with them. You end up having the number four overall pick in the draft. Pretty much tells you exactly how they finished last year. 
Um, so you obviously can't do well with them, with Matt Ryan throwing to them. What makes you think that Matt Ryan's going to do exponentially better throwing to Kyle Pitts? I, don't know. I think the answer there would have either been quarterback or defense. Because you're not improving the situation on the offensive side by taking Kyle Pitts. And you're really not improving anything on the team. You're just adding another weapon. Yeah. Kind of like kind of like what the Giants did. Um, yeah, I see the uh, I see the comparison there. And here's the magical thing. I think the Bucs with their 32nd pick picked someone on defense, which is good. You know, I think it's good to shore up a defense. Yeah. But for the Falcons. This was a move. It was like, hmm, yeah, we like both sides of the ball, but we're really going to shore up that offense. We're really going <laughs> to really gonna make sure that's good. Like, it's, I have no problem with adding to a great unit whatsoever. But to call, first of all, to call their offense great might be a bit hyperbolic, right? I think we're all, we could it's all. It's better than average. It's above average. Yeah, they could be. I don't even know their points per game off the top of my head and how they rank. But regardless, Anyone with half a brain could see that defense is a train wreck. And the blown leads, oh, just disgustingly terrible defense. So, so bad. So bad. Um, yeah, I don't know. Right. I, I just think you can't go wrong taking the best player left. But I think you could. I get, I get I needs like a huge thing. Like, if I don't need a quarterback, I'm not going to take, like, Justin Fields. But I think that early think. you can go wrong. Yeah, unfortunately um, so. Let's see. Next, we will do. Ooh, let's make this spicy. Let's go 15. 15, the New England Patriots draft Mac Jones. Now, um, texting with our good friend Evan over at Washed Up Sports Podcast. Uh, big Patriots fan. Huge Patriots, Patriots fan. Uh, absolutely despises Mac Jones. <laughs> Hates Mac Jones was texting me all of last night saying, why the hell is Mac Jones going to be so good? Like he's, he's not going to be good. He was telling me that he's just the next AJ McCarron, uh, who for those that don't know is now the backup quarterback on the Falcons, which is saying something. Um, so I guess the question is, is this a good pick for Mac Jones at 15? Did they get away with Mac Jones at 15? Is that a steal of a pick for, because a lot of people had them trading up to get Mac Jones, but they didn't have to go anywhere. They, they, yeah, I knew from the start they wouldn't. Have um, or was it a bad, bad pick to not trade up and not trade up further to get maybe a Justin Fields? Uh, Frank, we'll start with you. Uh, well, we all know that he needed a quarterback. It's no secret. Cam, Cam Newton is not the answer there. Um, he's a good he's a good plug and see what happens, but he's not the answer. Um, so I would have. Based on what the Bears gave up to get the Giants pick at 11, I would have said the Patriots probably should do that because we all know the Patriots are going to be decent because they're, they're always pretty good. So it's not like their pick is going to have a ton of value. So I, I probably would have traded up. But for what they got at 15, I feel like it was the right pick. Now, Evan probably knows more than me because he's a Patriots fan. But at 15, they needed a quarterback. I think I think Mac Jones is the best quarterback left. And that's, that's who they should have taken. I don't see any other pick that would have made more sense. Eric? Here's the thing. Once again, college to professional, apples and oranges, I recognize this. But Alabama, you know, I think you'd find it difficult to find someone who's um, who would disagree that they are not a great football school. You know, they have a great program. And I think if you're going to equate someone in the NFL to having a great program and having running a tight ship, if you will, I think it's the Patriots. So I think he's proven that if it's an organized fashion he's uh, playing under, I think he'll do well. I think Belichick's the perfect guy to handle that kind of a noise. that kind of not exactly elusive, but safe, steady kind of quarterback. So I think it's a great pick. Yeah, I think I think the pick was uh, was pretty good as well. I mean, you saw what the like kind of what Frank said. You saw what the Bears had to give up to trade up to get Justin Fields. Um, if the Patriots wanted to, they would have had to give up that, if not more, to get in front of them uh, to get whatever. Well, they would have to give up more because their pick's not going to be as valuable as the Bears pick next year. Right. Uh, well, so, assuming they're better. which I assume. But they would have had to give up more to get Justin Fields, which if you're going to give up that much – now, obviously, we don't – going back, we, we, we don't know if Mac Jones still would have been there um, had they traded up. 
and they don't they wouldn't have known that either but um i think giving up that much to move up just draft justin fields instead of mac jones wouldn't have been a good move i think staying put staying where they are and grabbing mac jones where they did uh was an incredible move by bill belichick i think mac jones will be good in the nfl i don't think he'll be great I don't think he'll be anything special. A lot of people are saying Tom Brady 2.0. There's no Tom Brady 2.0. Um, yeah. I think Mac Jones, if I had to give a quarterback comparison uh, in the NFL, I would say Mac Jones is a solid Kirk Cousins. I was going to, I was thinking the exact same thing, man. It's the exact solid, same game. Solid Kirk Cousins. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it was like, like again, seeing what they had, what the Bears had to give up to get the Giants pick, I feel like it was the right move. Just stay put and see what you get out of Mac Jones. Um. All right, last and final uh, opinion that I want, and we cannot make a sports uh, podcast that covers the NFL draft without bringing up this topic because it was the topic of the entire day on Thursday. The Green Bay Packers uh, have released the statement by Aaron Rodgers that said that Aaron Rodgers was not happy at all in the situation that he was in. Obviously, last year, the Packers go out and they draft quarterback Jordan Love in the first round after Aaron specifically said that he wanted receivers and weapons, and they didn't do that. Now, Aaron Rodgers then goes out and has a MVP season. Uh, nearly wins a uh, wins the NFC Championship and leads his team to the Super Bowl. But this year, with Aaron Rodgers still not happy, the Green Bay Packers decide to make things worse, and they get a cornerback, out of wide receiver, cornerback. So Eric, I'll start with you, Eric Stokes. 29th overall pick by the Packers. Is that a good pick by the Packers or a bad pick by the Packers? It's a dumb pick, and here's why. How old's how how old's Bray now? Do we know 43, 44? 40, 65. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, 67. he's not a, he's on AARP. That's all we know. <laughs> yeah. The point is what he retires, he's old. Got that senior citizen discount. Exactly. Right. He can go to Denny's and be so happy. Him and what do we think of Denny's? I don't know. I'm kind of indifferent about Denny's. Okay. Yeah, different for another podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, listen. Sorry, my just, he had an MVP season, right? There's this is so so simple. You wanna you wanna keep those in your life who mean something to you happy, right? Go back <laughs> to the relationship thing, right? It's the, very intense thing. You true. wanna what'd you say? It's a very intense way to put it, but true. It's true. It's a <laughs> Aaron Rodgers is the centerpiece. We'll we'll go for a business metaphor instead, Frank. He's the there CEO. It's that simple. He's been bringing in the money. The CEO of the year, whatever award you want to give him, he was the MVP. Come on. Just give the guy what he wants. And that defense isn't even bad. It's not a bad defense. So, pro- os- honestly, maybe the worst pick we've discussed yet. That's how I feel. Um, yeah, I would have to agree with you. Probably the worst one. Um, definitely up there with the ETN pick, but I would say this one is the worst. Me too. Um, if you're gonna want, if you're gonna make Aaron Rodgers happy, take a wide receiver. If you want to move on from Aaron Rodgers and you want to make Jordan Love happy, take a wide receiver. I don't think we're, I don't think we're pleasing Jordan Love. He hasn't stepped on the field for them yet. They clearly think Jordan Love is the man now. Well, that was dumb in the first place. So, we also, that was dumb when they did it. You got to please somebody. They're not pleasing anybody by by taking a cornerback, except for the defensive coordinator. Um, but I don't know, of everything you could have done, even an offensive tackle, don't you don't necessarily have to go above and beyond and get a wide receiver. An offensive tackle, somebody on the offensive side of the ball that would have made the offense better, that would have worked. Mm. They did get Amari Rodgers um, in the th- – third round second or third round uh yesterday uh wide receiver out of clemson so they do have another a rogers on the team so we'll see how that they're only gonna have one soon 
Yeah, since then, Aaron Rodgers has requested, uh, well, not requested, uh, he has threatened to retire and is contemplating retirement. Uh, because of his, this is like McGregor retiring. It's ridiculous. Yeah, wait, hold on. So, could you say, could you say Rogers' career is in jeopardy? I think you I can say you. that. Yes, with a capital J E O P. Yes, jeopardy. Thanks, guys. Okay, that was it's a good show. Cool. Um, the only difference in the NFL, yeah, is if a player decides to retire, uh, with the contracts let with their contract still remaining, which. I believe Aaron Rodgers has one year left on his deal. He is getting a lot older. So that one year does mean a lot. They can't – he can't go to another team uh, in that one year. He has to wait yeah, until sure. his contract is up. If he wanted to go to a different team, he would have to request trade, and then the Packers would have to trade his rights um, over to a different team. So – I don't think he's going anywhere. It's dumb. If he does decide to retire, that's it. I, no, no, he, no. I he's, he's not coming back. No, he's not. There'd be no reason to come back. Why would he come back? And honestly, if I were Aaron Rodgers, just, just head out. I mean, he's got nothing to prove to anyone else. Yeah. It's not like walk he's still going to Super Bowl Walk out on top. Walk out the best player in the NFL. You just won yeah. the NBA. All right. I mean, we also didn't talk about what I think that's the worst pick in the first round. It was it was Leatherwood at 17. No, I – They could have got Leatherwood in like the, the second or third round probably. Well, you could say the same about a lot of guys. You could say about the same about ETN. You could say the same well, about – Well, that's at 30. Um, that's at 32. This was what, 17, 16? Well, 17 was Leatherwood. I think the thing with Leatherwood is – uh, Mike Mayock, GM of the Raiders, he doesn't really value uh, mock drafts. Obviously, used to work for NFL Network, so he's made a lot of mock drafts in his life. Uh, but he doesn't really look at mock drafts when it comes to being a GM. So he makes his own player rankings. And if he sees value in Alex Leatherwood being the 17th pick in the NFL draft, he's going to make that pick. Well, He's I get that, but I think there are better players behind him. Like, I didn't think like, – Well, I you think may you... think that. You may think that. But he may not. Sure, but I, and... I think I think other teams also thought that he wouldn't go until the second or third round. Um, I think he was one of those guys that was early second round. Yeah, so I feel um, like – well, I don't know what pick they had in the second round. I have no idea, so I don't know. It was around the same uh, – It's around 17, 18, 16, 49, 17. Around, around, around 50, give or take. Two or three. Yeah, give or take. So yeah, I think he would have been under fifty. You also take into account that the past few years before this year, um, by the way, Alex Leatherwood opted out of the uh, twenty twenty season, so mm-hmm. he didn't play at all this year, uh, hurting his draft stock. But prior to this college, this past college football season, Alex Leatherwood was a top five pick in the draft. Like, if you looked at all the mock drafts prior to the season, all the 2021 mock drafts, it was Trevor Lawrence and then sometimes Patrick Sertan, sometimes somebody else, Justin Fields, and then it was Alex Leatherwood. Yeah, but just like you said, this guy doesn't put any value in mock drafts. Well, I'm going to put value in mock draft from two years ago. Like, I think it's way different. I'm just he- saying that Alex Leatherwood has that talent. He hasn't played in a year because he sat out due to COVID, um, but he is that good. I'm not doubting his talent. I'm just saying he would have been there later if they wanted him. He could have been, but I think if you're going to get – If you really really want him that bad and you think he's going to get picked, you trade up for him. If you want to to get an offensive tackle and you want to make sure you get your guy, obviously he was their guy. Obviously they, they valued him third probably overall to or maybe fourth behind Elijah Vera Tucker. Uh, fourth in terms of also offensive linemen and they got their guy when they needed their guy they weren't going to pass on their guy to risk somebody else taking him sure I mean, i'm do what you want but i don't know i just don't agree with it but what, what the hell do i know yeah you know nothing um i want to this differently that'll do it for this week for us um check out our mock drafts on the instagram uh congratulations to frank for 
That's two uh, years in a row. I beat you guys. I don't know if Eric did it last year. I don't think he did. No idea. I, don't either. I can't remember. Um, I don't think he did. We got a tight, uh, tight pick'em race. Thirty points to go for a hundred for two of you guys, and thirty-one for me. So uh, it's definitely, definitely getting interesting. Uh, Alex Bowman could tie it up tomorrow night, possibly at the Bushy McBush race. Oh, um, did you look up the other four names? Huh? Oh, did yes. Look I up did. the other four finalist I did names. Find it. Um, <laughs> number go. one. Number one was the Bush Latte Four Hundred. Not okay. bad. Number two was the Bush Nectar of the Cobbs 400. <laughs> That's awesome. What's wrong with that one? Number three. This might be my f- second favorite to Bushy McBush race. Uh, number three was For the Farmers 400. There it is. Uh, and then there. number four. Number four was the Bushy McBush race. I don't know. I like the Nectar one. Nectar of the Cobbs. Yeah, I like that one. Too cute. Too cute. <laughs> it's 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 less cute than Bushy McBush 400. That's flat out stupid. Nothing cute. <laughs> That's just dumb, which I can get on board with. Yeah, it's NASCAR. Fans are dumb. I'm gonna, get me some, I'm gonna get me some Bushy McBush race merch. Please do. That's gonna That's gonna be in the wardrobe for pretty soon. Oh, that's that would be amazing. <laughs> um already shopping oh yeah i'm scrolling right now um no the uh that'll do it for this week uh we'll see y'all next week uh yeah adios